Dude, Sax, I love that look. Look at that shirt. Look at that, man. Is it too noisy for a podcast? No, you look very relatable. You're like a you're like a, an American man, like just like at home doing stuff. Is he trying to go full Tucker on us? It is a really, really horrendous shirt that you're wearing. That is a horrible, <laughs> I mean, I, that was the same shirt Tucker was wearing last week. Oh my God, Sax is going to be so appealing to middle America right now. He's like, absolutely. Look, he's going for the everyman. Yeah, he's an everyman. He doesn't have a blazer on. He's trying to get the purple pills. Are you going to go chop wood with Tucker? Yeah. <laughs> I may not be a man of the people, but I do try to be a man for the people. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the All In Podcast. It's uh, obviously been an intense week, and there is a topic. Uh, there's really only one topic to talk about this week, and that's the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. With me to break all this down, I'm going to take it from a couple of different angles. The Rain Man, David Sachs, with his power flannel on today. He's going to go chop some wood after this, trying to appeal to the everyman. <laughs> power flannel. <laughs> it's a power flannel. Power flannel. I think that was gifted by Tucker. And the <laughs> Sultan of Science, hot off the- How do you know, how do you know it's uh, flannel instead of uh, cashmere? How do you know it didn't come from one of Chamath's little um Chamath baby, would never uh, wear that shirt. Baby if, if you sent one. that shirt to Chamath, he'd burn it. That would go right in his pizza oven. I wouldn't burn it, but I, I would wipe my butt with it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, here we go, folks. Uh, and hot off the launch of the Canna Beverage printer replicator the sultan of science himself david freeberg and back from a little holiday the dictator himself chamath palihapitiya with a, a jedi robe T tell us about the jedi robe that you elected for this week darth palpatia well this is darth <laughs> palpatine hapatia well, I, I mean, this is, look, this is, yes, it is cashmere. We are, we're running out of time. I have to wear through the rest of my few garments, my new <laughs> garments, before it's springtime. Mm. And then I have to go to the, mm. you know, the linen and the cotton. Got it. So you're enjoying the final days of cashmere. Well, I do. I did find some mm. baby cashmere, light, thin, ah. you know, you can wear them probably until April, maybe even May. So. Right. We have that going for us. All right. Well, there you go. And is there a specific date that you uh, shift over from to the linens? And to be, to be honest with you, I have a I have a team I consult with. Got it. Okay, the team's day. working on that. All right. They're working on that. Right? They're working on a recommendation. All right. So we can still laugh. Uh, it's kind of hard to talk about other topics when a war has broken out. Uh, I don't know if I have to go too deep into recapping what's happening because it is a, a static situation. But there's been massive uh, fallout from the war, both economically, lives lost, and it's escalated pretty dramatically. We had a pretty crazy moment last night. Uh, we're taping this on Friday, March 4th, last night, a uh, nuclear facility, the largest one in Europe, uh, was involved in a firefight. It seems to have been secured and the Russians have taken control of it, but there were people bombing it. I, where to begin here? Um, I think maybe Sachs, we can, you can start us off with a little bit of your assessment of the situation as it stands in week two. Yeah, I mean, when we broke up last week, this war was just breaking out and we were still talking about ways that we might defuse it. Obviously, that was too late. Um, and I think everybody, probably Putin first and foremost, thought this would be a cakewalk and it has turned out not to be. The resistance by the Ukrainians has been fierce uh, and it's been sort of uh, galvanized by their leader, Zelensky, you know, th at the very beginning of the hostilities, he made the decision to stay and fight. He had that video that came out with his cabinet standing behind him, that galvanized all the people of Ukraine to stand behind them. And then the West is now wants to stand behind the whole country of Ukraine. So it's really been, you know, amazing leadership by Zelensky. And, um, you know, it's too bad in a way we didn't have that kind of leadership among our allies in, say, Afghanistan. <laughs> You know, we had uh, this guy, Ghani, who got in the first helicopter out of there when the, when the trouble started. Um, so, uh, you know, his, his leadership has been strong and admirable, and it's basically galvanized the West. And I think that Putin, I think, must have underestimated the level of resistance he would face and also the unity of the West in terms of sanctioning him uh, and providing support for the Ukrainians. 
all that being said, I think we're now at a very dangerous sort of crossroads because the situation is is very volatile uh, and you've got so much variance in the outcomes that can occur now. Um, I think you're seeing people prognosticate everything from, you know, uh, Kiev gets turned to rubble in the next week and the Russians basically power through and win to this turns into a long term insurgency to you know, there's going to be some sort of uprising in Moscow and, and you know, regime change there. <clears throat> and I think because the variance is so high, because all the sort, you know, because the two sides are playing for all the marbles, so to speak, and you've even got, I think, intemperate and insane remarks by Lindsey Graham basically calling for, uh, you know, calling for Putin's ouster, you know, which I think is going to give. I mean, uh, that the, quote, just the, to, to pause there. Give, yeah, it's going to give the Kremlin, I think, a, a propaganda tool, but for for rallying people internally. But the 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 point is just it seems like we're playing for all the marbles right now, and um, I think that's a very dangerous place to be. And I'm seeing, you know, insane rhetoric and commentary by people trying to push us into war. And so, just the other day, you know, one of the one of the things I tweeted about is one of the craziest things you hear is we're already in World War Three. Well, and, you know, Kasparov said this. I mean, he's kind of a known to be a little bit of a hothead, but you also had Fiona Hill, who's supposed to be a Russia expert from the State Department, who frequently is the go-to source for CNN and other publications, also saying we're already in World War III. Well, no, we're not. I mean, if we were in World War III, you'd see the mushroom clouds, assuming you were still alive and not vaporized. So it is incredibly reckless for people to be saying things like this. And there is just, you know, this drumbeat of war that is being pushed by cable news and by uh, the Twitter sphere. And just today, uh, thankfully this morning, NATO announced that it would not be uh, imposing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. That was why, why is that important? Explain well, that. Well, because, because there's all these people who are saying, well, we, we shouldn't send boots on the ground to Ukraine. We don't need to get militarily involved, but let's, let's do a no-fly zone to basically yeah. help the Ukrainians. The yeah, how do you enforce that? that? <laughs> what a no-fly zone means is that you're going to shoot down Russian planes. Yes. That's what it means. You are going to war. It may not be boots on the ground, it's boots in the sky. So had we done that, had we given in to the emotional appeals, and I think we all feel the tug on our heartstrings, but had we given in to that, we would be potentially in a shooting war with Russia. And that would be the most serious, we're already in, I think, the most serious foreign policy situation in, in you know, my lifetime. And, you know, I'm almost half a century old. So, you know, it's, um, it's very dangerous. And, um, you know, I've been saying for the last month on this podcast, I've been actually advocating for the cause of not getting militarily involved. And a month ago, it seemed like an argument I didn't need to make. But now it really does, because okay. uh, both sides are, are sort of, and it, this is, there's almost a unanimity in Washington that we need to continue escalating the situation. Sachs, my, my concern is less about the Washington um, intent to, to put boots on the ground or boots in the sky. And I'm much more concerned about NATO allies. There's 30 member nations in NATO. And um, if any one of them does something stupid, if there's any action by any even rogue element um, within the military, uh, or um, some statement, even by some politician at some NATO member, um, you know, you could see a reaction, potentially from Putin, and then Article Five kicks in, which is this collective defense article in NATO, and then the United States has an obligation to enter the conflict. Uh, and, and that's the one scenario you didn't mention, which is the scenario I am most concerned about, most frightened by, is we don't know when the when or if a Franz Ferdinand moment could occur here, that someone does something stupid, some Polish tank rolls across a border and shoots down some shoots at some Russian, you know, tank, and then the Russian tank crosses over. And then all of a sudden, we've got to go to the rescue. And we've got to go defend that 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 NATO member. And then all of a sudden, this whole thing sparks into a wildfire. It felt like last night could have been that when you look at the fog of war, you know, it was Basically, this nuclear reactor, if it explodes, if it has, uh, you know, an, an episode would do just tremendous damage to the whole continent. I mean, if you're living in, yeah. a, in a NATO country or in Moscow, if that thing had gone up, which I know is a, a very um, uh, would be a rare occurrence and they were shutting it down, et cetera. So but there, there was that rumor last night. It felt like yeah. there could be a tipping point. Nuclear material is like 
a whole nother level. It's like, um, it has nothing to do with war at that point. It has to do with uh, extinction. You know, a, a nuclear reactor is almost like a temple on earth to God. <laughs> it's like this holiest of holies. No one can, should, or ever could consider that to be a point in conflict ever. It's nothing should be touched. Let the wars of humans continue on the rest of the earth surface. But nuclear weapons, nuclear reactors, that's unleashing the fury of the gods on Olympus. And when they come down, they scorch the earth and um, nuclear material, you know, is an extinction kind of or it, it's, you know, kind of a, a cataclysmic event for this planet. And so, you know, th that that goes well beyond this idea of like, is it NATO? Or did someone shoot at someone? Mm -hmm. Let's all go fight. It becomes like almost existential to the to the condition of humans. Well, so what does that say about Putin? Then I mean, Putin targeted that facility. No, hold on a second. Hold on. I think that's fake news at this point. You see the tweet by Michael Schellenberger. So wow. Hold on a second. You said this is last fog of war. Last night's tweet. I did see last night's tweet. Okay. Yeah. So I don't necessarily think this is fog of war. I think this might be disinformation. So here's what happened is, and, and it, it wasn't just misreporting. Zelensky tweeted out a video where he basically was saying, this plant has been attacked. It's on fire. It's going to be Chernobyl times 10 for all of Europe. And then the foreign minister of Ukraine came out with another statement just like that simultaneously. So this was coordinated. And then I saw on all the cable news networks, all of them, there was no difference between Fox and CNN and yeah. MSNBC, same reporting. They were all in a panic about this. And then, you know, and that now, and then we find out very quickly the truth, which was confirmed by the White House, which is no radiation, no explosion. Um, the, the fire was sort of tangential. It wasn't core to the plant. So I think we have to be very careful now to guard ourselves against disinformation that is designed, frankly, to escalate the situation and pull us to draw us into a war. Simultaneous with this, there was a New York Times op-ed by Zelensky and, and one of his aides who was standing next to him sort of transcribing. And the headline was something like, I'm fighting to the last breath. Look, that, that is heroic. I mean, I think we can all recognize Zelensky's bravery and courage in, 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 in doing that. However, the point of that article was to tug on our heartstrings to get us to involved in the war. And what he said in that, ar that article was, you don't need to send boots on the ground, but impose the no-fly zone, which we just talked about is a declaration of war. Yeah, but no, no, what I was talking about with the nuclear power plant is not that it wasn't being hyped up by the media. Certainly, like this was becoming like their ratings bonanza, and they were definitely hyping it up. And maybe Zelensky was giving a warning, hey, this could escalate. But the Russians did target that. They were bombing around it. They were firefighting. So to Freeberg's point, like, this is, I think, crazy behavior by Russian troops, by Putin, to actually, you know, try to seize a nuclear power plant. It seems pretty crazy. Chamath, you've been silent thus far. Let's get Chamath involved here. There's a 17th century phrase that says adversity makes for strange bedfellows. And I think what happens when you are in the middle of enormous adversity, um, you know, you need to do whatever it takes to win, right? That's, I think, why Zelensky is so patriotic and viewed so heroically around the world now. Um, he's trying to defend his country and his people. Um, I want to take the counter of, David, what you said. I actually think we are at war. But it's the most positive form of it in the sense that we are learning a different kind of warfare. Now, if you think about how we used to fight up until basically uh, the Persian Gulf War, it was armaments and tanks. And then that evolved in the Middle East because we had to fight insurgents and, you know, uh, urban terrorism in many ways, right? I think this is a, a way in which we are learning that there's a different kind of warfare as well, which is fundamentally economic. And so, you know, it may not take the same shape as drones and missiles and fire and guns and bullets. But I think you would be foolish to make the mistake that we are now uh, not at economic war with Russia. Um, and at the end of the day, the outcome is the same, which is either they survive or they don't survive. And everything we've done points to that we are willing to fight. Um, and we are willing to put a lot of economic collateral um, and chips on the field in order to win this battle. So I think in that respect, we are kind of at a war. 
and we, are we on a, is, is this a nuclear level economic uh, this decoupling? This is my point is like everybody yeah. has a historical framework where they want to go back to how the natural path of escalation works. And I think this is a very different form of escalation that we need to consider. And I think that this is the kind of warfare that may actually, um, you know, be the the way in which wars are fought in the future. You seize assets, you shut off access to supply routes, you make it impossible for anything to work. So, you know, I'll give you a simple example. A form of warfare is what's happening right now in the sense that, you know, for example, the Russian skies are completely clear, not just because that, you know, no uh, external airlines will necessarily fly there, but because Boeing and Rolls Royce and GE and Airbus basically pulled all of their support, all of their parts, right? Um, we've gone to war with respect to their petroleum and LNG supplies. How? Not necessarily because we won't still stop payments, which we are still enabling, but because the actual refiners won't take the oil and the LNG, because they then would be subject to sanctions. The people who would ship that are no longer taking those uh, payments or those, those barrels of oil into the marketplace because they can't get insured by international banks. So in all of these various ways, we are actually at war. And I think, you know, maybe this is the way war should be fought in the future, because it'll save thousands of lives in, in the more classic way of describing how lives are sacrificed for. I want to make a counterpoint. My concern, Tamath, is that we've rushed into a reactive response um, with respect to sanctions and seizing assets in a way that maybe not be calculated over the long run. Meaning, like, are we setting ourselves up for another Iraq Afghanistan situation where we, we rush into a war and we don't have an exit strategy. And the issue is that a lot of the assets that we've effectively wiped the value down to zero have a repercussive effect on global businesses and the global economy. As, a, as an example, you know, this company that we were texting about called Luke Oil, they were worth $60 billion a few days ago. We effectively wiped them out to zero. And um, 65 to 70% of the shares in that company were held and owned by public uh, um, retirement funds, pension funds, mutual funds that are used for retirees in Europe and the United States. And, um, and so, you know, a significant I think amount- this is a complete red herring. I, I, I've told you this in the private chat. I think this is a complete, complete red herring. And the reason it's a red herring is that the global total market cap of all of these businesses is meaningfully different than the amount of total capex that these guys represent. And in as much as you are going to take the equity values of certain of these companies to zero, it's in the grand scheme of things, not that much equity value. We can absorb it. We're not talking trillions of dollars. For, forget about the equity value. Just think about the economic repercussions where there is leveraged uh, positions and swaps and derivatives in place, counterparty swaps in place with a lot of these companies that are now going to default. And we're not going to know that till the end of this month, when everything has to settle, and no one's going to be able to make their payments. I, Small price to pay, Friedberg, if... Well, hold on one sec. This applies both to Russian companies that are suppliers and buyers of assets, um, products, and services from international businesses. And all of a sudden, that line item just zeroes out. I don't believe the economic value of all of that oil exceeds the market cap of Luke Oil. I don't believe it. And I don't believe further that the economic value that's held by uh, non-Russian actors is meaningfully more than a few tens of billions of dollars. We're going to find out pretty quick. For sanctions... By the way, Russia and the Ukraine combined account for roughly 25% of global wheat exports. Let me, let me say it differently. That wheat goes to Egypt, and from Egypt it goes throughout Africa. And there's a lot of nations and a lot of people that depend on that food supply and that food supply is now cut off. Okay, I understand. But now we were talking about something different. You want to talk about wheat? We can talk about wheat. But I'm just talking about generally, about I'm talking about zeroing all this stuff out and cutting them off completely. Hold on, hold on a second. W one of the things you have to realize, Friedberg, is that the purpose of sanctions is to create massive pain that stops a madman dictator from, agreed. from point, yeah. invading other countries and causing a world war. So while it is My tragic is that, that some pension, is, hold is, on, but, let me finish, yeah. Friedberg. While it is tragic, that people will suffer and people maybe can't get their Netflix or can't get their Facebook or some wheat will get disrupted. All of this is the, the, w is the better choice than going to war with Putin. And it's meant to create pain and suffering. It does not create pain and suffering 
then Russia will not change. I understand it, that's the, the point of sanctions. J.K. I totally get it. I totally understand the intent and I totally understand the point. My, my point is, have we really done the calculus? Because when you make this much of an impact this fast, when you rush into what we might call an economic war with such significant um, abrasion in such a significantly short period of time, I don't, do I we don't really have a sense of where the calculus is? Because yet. I don't know where the wheat imports are going to come from for Egypt now. And I don't know where the millions of people that depend on that wheat supply are now going to get fed from. And I don't think we have an answer. If we had a strategy that said, here's the solution, here's the solution from an energy perspective, from a food perspective, from a capital perspective to fill all these holes. Otherwise, we may all end up sharing that cost over the long run. And it's going to be a big cost to bear. I think you're wrong. And the reason why I think you're wrong is we've already seen how this has played out before. So in the last two years, we learned what governments are willing to do when you have supply shocks and demand shocks. And what they do is they turn on the money printer and they create enormous amounts of stimulus, okay? And what we have now is a point where if these shocks are really, really, really meaningful globally, I think you're going to see the Federal Reserve and the ECB and the Bank of Canada and the Bank of Japan step in in a very coordinated way to provide liquidity to these markets. And I think what that has the byproduct of doing is blunting the economic consequences to everybody but the person who is sanctioned. Do you think that's inflationary as well? No. And the other thing, in fact, it's the opposite. I Look, David and I have been the ones that said the risk is to a recession. We are now teetering towards a recession. Nick, you should throw this thing that I sent to you guys before. If you look back over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years and you look at every single period of when there has been a recession. What's interesting to note is that it's not always been the case that the price of energy has risen by 50% in a recession. But it is always the case that when energy prices spike by 50%, we enter a recession. We will contract as an economy. The government will have to become more accommodating. That is the price of this economic war that we have started. And I think it's a just price because what's happening is not supportable. So, Chamath, you are sure that we're, or, or you, you feel strongly that we're not entering into a condition of significant stagflation, where we're not able to re-stimulate the economy and we inflate everything with all this money printing? I don't even know what stagflation is, to be completely honest with you. I don't think I've ever seen it. I know how it's classically described. I think it's like pseudo-intellectual kind of gobbledygook speak. What I can tell you is, I think that prices are too high in certain core commodities and goods. I think what's going to happen is we are going to find a way to subsidize those prices coming down. And I think the simplest way to do it is for the government to step in and become a buffer. And it will drive massive deficits. It'll drive increasing amounts of debt. But I think that is a simple way for us to make sure we put and ratchet the pressure. And just to speak on this other point, we have only just begun. Meaning just today as we started the pod, uh, Biden came out with an incremental new set of sanctions on Russian crude. So we're not at the, even in the beginning, we're at the beginning of the beginning. I'm just worried this is a new kind of nuclear war. I mean, it's just, well, it's frightening. I, if, this is, if this is the new nuclear war, then it's a blessing because we're not going to have millions of people die. Sachs, is, are the no, sanctions I think, I think just right? Too strong, too little? I, I think vis a vis saying, like versus going to war. I think Freeber, what Freeberg is saying is that we're on an escalatory path here. That starts with sanctions, then leads to more and more sanctions, then includes arming the Ukrainians and no, 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 that's, uh, and a, that's, on and on that's a big, that's a big leap. And I think, I think, no, again, we're already you, arming them. The Germans gave the gave the Ukrainians javelin missiles last week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, oh, this I know. that's true. Sorry, sorry, I know yeah, absolutely. You're right. And there's there's a lot more coming. So you know what I would say is uh, back to something Chama said, which is we're already at war. I you know call me a uh, call me non-binary, call me a non-binary thinker, but <laughs> I don't I don't like dividing our options in that simply into war and peace. I think there's like a spectrum here, and there and and, and you could call that spectrum an escalatory path. So there's sanctions. There's arming them and, and so on down the line. And I don't like characterizing what we're in or what we're doing as war, because once you're in war, then it justifies anything. And for the other side too. So such a, you're such a pacifist, Sax. It's awesome. Keep going. Look, we have to remember. Wait, no, no. Let me just clarify what I'm saying. Yeah. Let me just wait. I didn't say we're at war. I said we're at a form of a war. It's an economic war. It's just a different well, I hope kind it stays of economic then. 
You know, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't like using that metaphor, but let's not debate semantics. But to, to Jason's point, am I a pacifist? What I would say is, you know, during the Cold War, we have to remember that this philosophy of containment that we had, the goal was to prevent the spread of communism while conceding that the countries that were already communist, that were behind the Iron Curtain, we would not challenge. We would not seek to roll that back. Why? Because we did not want hot war with the Soviet Union. And everything was calibrated to make sure that we did not blunder ourselves into nuclear war as mutually assured destruction. And yet, it almost happened anyway, most notably with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But rules of the game evolved, right? And so, we did things like arm the Mujahideen you know, rebels in Afghanistan with Stinger missiles. So, that would be sort of the equivalent of the Javelins. But we sure as hell didn't put the American flag or a NATO flag on the boxes and on the trucks delivering those weapons. We delivered them through Pakistan, through intermediaries. There were rules of the game that we all understood. Now, I hope we are following similar rules, but it feels to me like we are. And, and I think one good thing is that both Biden and certainly Putin remember the Cold War. They were very involved in the Cold War. They're old enough to remember it. And hopefully we remember those rules. The most encouraging thing I've heard Biden say this entire time was when he reiterated at the State of the Union that we would not get militarily involved. It's very important that he keeps saying that because, you know, the Russians are looking at these statements. So, we just have to remember that, again, we're on this escalatory path. And, and one of the things that's going on here is, is, is a purity spiral. So, there's a social media version of this and there's like a partisan version of this. So, the social media version of this is that the way that you show that you're on the, the side of the good of Ukraine is you advocate for the no-fly zone. You advocate for the escalation. But if you advocate for slowing down or de-escalating or just taking a breath, you're called a Putin bootlicker, you're called Neville Chamberlain. I've already gotten about a thousand reply tweets coming at me saying that. So the purity spiral on Twitter that we've seen in so many other contexts now pushes everybody into, the, into World War III. Similarly, there's a partisan dynamic where no matter what Biden says or does, no matter what new sanctions he imposes, the Republicans will always denounce him for weakness, and the media and Fox News will always denounce him for weakness. It's a one-way ratchet. How much more do you want him to do is the question, and I think Freeberg asked you know, a, a great question, which is, what is the end game here? What are we trying to accomplish? And what I'm worried about is the, the dynamic, this, this um, frenzy that, you know, what, what Balaji is called the chimp frenzy of social media, right, with cable news and now social media and partisan rhetoric, it all pushes us towards continual escalation and World War III. And who are going to be the grown-ups who say, listen, this is foolish, stand down, take a breath. By the way, we might want to keep some of these cards in reserve. We don't have to play every single thing right to now. To your point, um, I saw Lady G trending. I guess this is his nickname. But Lindsey Graham literally explicitly said somebody in Russia needs to assassinate Putin. I mean, this is a crazy escalation. And then on the other side, inside the, you have people saying, you know, Putin's a genius. And so we are going to continue to ratchet up these economic sanctions, guys. We are, this is the beginning of the beginning of the economic sanctions. We're not even in the middle of them. What you do you know, think he's going to do, Chamath? Like, what is the exit ramp for Putin if we keep doing this and I, he's in, I in I a corner? No, I have no idea, but I think that it's clear. It's pretty, it's pretty plain as day if you're going to be unemotional and just look at this from our, from the American and European perspective, which is the only end game now uh, is regime change, right? And one step be before regime change is a complete sort of detente and somehow, you know, um, surrender by Putin in the sense that he pulls back from Ukraine. Not if 70% of his people support him, which is what a poll polling figure showed yeah, this well, morning, right? And, and you, you be know, careful you can with those polls. I mean, people in Russia are not exactly going to say I'm anti- Putin in a survey. <laughs> well, J. Cal, I mean, look, you can say that to, to kind of defend what you believe about Putin. No, I'm not saying it to but, defend what I I'm believe. Saying, like, look, I'm saying it for, pragmatically. Just, just, just suspend it and, and assume for a moment that maybe that is the position of those people. Maybe they do believe in pride of nation, like the United States would believe in pride of nation if we were attacked. If everyone took economic sanctions against our country, would we not stand up and defend our president and our nation and say that our country is the prime country and our way of living and our life and we should be left alone 
you know, this is um, this is not an issue for the world to get involved in. Okay, but and, let's and, play this and, up. And so how do you end up, assume that is the case, how do you end up having a regime change where you don't have a country that's actually in revolt, but you I have, have no a country? Idea. But let's play this out. Like, look, where people are, say, are, are rallying for what this guy is doing, if that is the case, right? Let's move our conversation to exit ramps. From where we are, there's there's two options, right? There's two options. Option one is Ukraine successfully defends itself, right? And option two is Russia, quote unquote, wins. Okay, let's just go down that branch for one second. Or they settle. There's a third one, Shema. They they come to a peace treaty, which is what's happened previously. Oh, there's a third, and then there's like I, I guess what you're saying, Jason, is like everybody just kind of stops where they're they are in place. Yes, they do some, a peace treaty. Something. They give them the east of the Ukraine of Ukraine. Got it. Well, let's let's play it. So then what happens to all of these economic sanctions? Are they undone? That would be part of the negotiation, right? Yeah. Maybe undone based on conditions. The big question is, are their reparations paid one way or the other? And how do those get funded? Well, those and reparations. Does the, does the IMF get involved and say, hey, we're going to fund your $300 billion war damage bill to the Ukraine and you know, right. there ends or up do being they a, just confiscate the $650 billion sitting in foreign bank accounts that's owned by the Central Bank of Russia? Again, like, how do you go back and lead a nation? And how does a nation accept that? How do they accept that um, their sovereignty has now been challenged when a few months ago, so they, they were the aggressor, right? But it's, then don't all I mean, look at what happened to, to Japan, by the way, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's a very similar kind of um, psychological shock that that may not be as easy to swallow with modern Russians. Don't all roads then lead to this is going to take a really long time to figure out a long it's either going to take a long time or it's going to catch on fire. I thought Georgia took like 11 days. So I mean, I, the, there's a Sun Tzu quote, uh, which I don't want to butcher, but uh, it was build your opponent a golden bridge to recruit retreat across there needs to be a golden bridge here. That's and my we point. talked about we don't see well, that we, we did talk about it two episodes ago where we said, well, we're not what if we're not we the people running the country. I, I'm talking about like, where's Biden? And where's the rest of the State Department in saying, here's an exit path for Putin, and clearly stated over and over again, and give him something to win, right? Like, I, th I think we gave a suggestion, David, correct me if I'm wrong, if you suggested or I did two weeks ago, when we start started talking I about did. this, which was, hey, why don't we just say, hey, we're, we're not going to allow the to allow Ukraine to join NATO for a decade. If you leave now, you we're know, we're so past that. We're so past we that. Are past are we? That we has are nothing it. to do with, I think, what's going on I now. I mean, you but, had countries, yeah. you had countries like that came off the sidelines and have done things they've, they haven't done 30, 40, 50 years, and in some cases ever. I mean, their well, industry um, just got gutted this week, Jake House. So, like, there's, I understand that. But we'll, there's, there's, a, there's 100 the million people worried about, there's 100 million people worried about food. If we had done it preemptively, would it have made I a difference? Think I think it would have made a huge difference. Like, look at Germany as an example. Germany undid 40 years of policy. You know, they had consistently been underinvesting relative to their GDP in the military. And they made an explicit commitment to basically just ramp that up back above 2%. You know, they've also made commitments around their energy uh, independence. You know, Switzerland is freezing bank accounts, something that they've really never done. And they've always stayed neutral. Sweden sending uh, uh, military support. So... There's a lot of countries in Europe, in continental Europe, that have found a voice. Well, it's terrifying, right, Shamath? I mean, to, to live with this threat just east of you, this would be like us living with this threat in, you know, Central America or something. This is like two steps away. And I think that's what people forget is the geography here of, you know, France, Germany, uh, Poland, Ukraine. I think this NATO commitment doesn't necessarily get it done at this point. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think it'd have to be part of anything. What's the exit, well, the exit ramp, ramp, in my opinion, is that you ratchet these economic sanctions up so severely that then, you know, look, the thing is, hopefully, um, in the aperture of war, memories are short in the sense that, you know, if you ratchet these things up very aggressively, now all of a sudden something from even two weeks ago seems like a much, much better place to be, Right. And so that could be an off ramp, which is like you basically find a way to take a lot of pressure off these economic sanctions in return for a detente. I mean, I don't know, but I'm making this up. I have no idea. I mean, it feels like there is no exit here because Putin has a lot of pride and nuclear weapons. Is this an, a no exit situation, Sachs? I think there's always an exit. We have to be willing to, to contemplate w what that is. I think... To your question, let's go back for a second up to, to your question of would it have made it a difference if we had taken NATO expansion off the table, say, last year? I think this year is probably already too late. But I think the answer is yes, regardless of whether you believe that NATO expansion is a real 
issue for the Russians or whether you think that's a pretext um, because, you know, people are in one of those two camps. Putin has been saying since 2008, in 2008, there was a NATO summit in Bucharest in which they basically declared, they proposed that Ukraine and Georgia could eventually be eligible for membership. That basically started this whole thing. The Russians at the time said, this is an absolute non-starter for us. It's a red line. No way will we allow this to happen. And in fact, later that year, they rolled the tanks into Georgia to put a stop to that idea in Georgia. In Ukraine, the conversation was deferred. They had this basically pro-Russian, democratically elected prime minister, president, uh, Yukonovich, um, who was deposed in a coup in 2014, a coup that was supported by our State Department and probably the CIA, okay? In reaction to that, Putin sees Crimea, not a year later, not months later, days later. The reason why he was able to seize it so quickly is the Russians actually have a naval base there at Sevastopol, okay? It's, it's at least, the area is leased from Ukraine, but they have a naval base there. It allows them to control the Black Sea. So the, the Russian thinking on this, if you believe it, goes that, listen, we're about to have a pro-Western ruler come into Ukraine, installed by a, what, a, an American-backed coup, and now we're going to lose our main naval base in the Black Sea, and it could be replaced with a NATO base. There's no way that's happening. So they moved to seize Crimea. And then after that, they started backing Russian separatists in the Donbass, and the civil war began. Okay, so that basically is what's been leading up to this. And then last year, they started getting very exercised about the possibility of this NATO proposal, which again, goes all the way back to 2008, becoming formally recognized and Ukraine joining NATO. And for, again, this is from the Russian perspective, okay? And we could talk about whether it's a pretext in a second, but from the Russian perspective, they said that, listen, and Putin gave a speech like this, if Ukraine joins NATO, because of Article 5, the next time we have a border dispute, which is all the time, right? We could end up getting drawn into a World War III with you guys. And so there is no way we're going to allow Ukraine to be part of NATO. And so they proposed, they basically by December had given an ultimatum to the State Department. Now, what was the response to that? Blinken came out at the critical moment and said, NATO's door is open and will remain open. Basically said, you guys can, you know, take a hike. Um, now, Obviously, that was an extremely provocative thing, and the Russians invaded Ukraine days later. Now, I think it's pretty obvious that if you take the Russians at their word that they believe, forget about whether you think it's true or not, but if you believe, take them at their word, that they, at the same word they've been saying since 2008, that this is a red line for them and they have a serious vital national interest there, then you should have diplomatically tried to resolve this issue. But even if you believe it was a pretext and Putin is making up this whole red line thing, and his real goal is the expansion of Mother Russia and all that or kind of stuff. Or reunification. Or reunification. Let's say that's his real goal. It still would have been a good idea for Blinken to basically declare that we were going to take NATO expansion off the table, which is simply an affirmation of the status quo. It's not appeasement. You're not giving anything up. You're reaffirming the status quo. Why would You're that have been a good idea? You're blocking something from happening in the future. Right. Why, why would that have been a good idea? Because... The polling on this showed that the Russian people, by two to one, were in favor of basically taking this kind of military action against Ukraine to prevent NATO expansion, but they were not in favor of doing it purely for unification. So you would have, if this was a pretext by Putin for his expansionist dreams, you could have taken away that card and it would have changed his calculus. Would it have prevented the war? We can't say. But in his calculus, he's got to think, well, wait a second, maybe the people won't be behind well, this. Here's the good news, too. If you had given him that chip and said that we're not going to let them into NATO and then he does invade. Now you've proven that this person is in reunification right. mode and he's deranged and he's a yes. warmonger and that this could go to other places and Finland and Poland right. and other he people have, have a real internal, reason. Yes, he would have had much scared. less internal support. So it would have been a much better chess move, right? So there was a failure to listen. And, um, and this is what concerns me. So I want to, you know, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, who I think was a great foreign policy president, only sort of wasn't so good on domestic, only got reelected, didn't get reelected. Uh, but everyone recognized him as a great foreign policy president. And um, he has a quote about this style of foreign diplomacy that we that his son 
practiced, Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld, and the same people now in the Biden administration, it's all the sort of neocon foreign policy. He said, the way he, he called uh, this iron ass foreign diplomacy. He called Cheney an iron ass, and he called Rumsfeld arrogant. And, um, you know, what he basically said is that these guys, he's talking about Cheney and Rumsfeld, they don't listen. They just want to kick ass and take names. They never want to listen to the other guy's point of view. And, um, you know, he thought this was tragic. He thought it ruined Bush 43's presidency. And I got to wonder, I mean, are we practicing the same style of iron ass diplomacy here? You know, um, well, now it's too late. We're already at war. I mean, I think if we had practiced, I, I, I think if Herbert Walker Bush and James Baker it had been president last year and, and James Baker was secretary of state, do you think we'd be in this mess? I don't think so. I think James Baker would have figured out a way to defuse it. Who is the uh, political? Who is the political scientist that you shared that uh, link from in the group chat uh, from the University of Chicago? Who had yeah, this, this guy John Mearsheimer, who's sort of king of I the. I watched realist. the video from him. Yeah. It's, it's quite convincing that yeah. we should have an approach that was, hey, we we don't need to incite Ukraine to break off. We could let them make their own decisions, and that we're kind of taunting. The Russians, and I don't think, you know, he makes a pretty convincing argument there. And I don't think you need to be a Putin apologist. You can keep in your head, this person's a dictator. This is a communist country. He's a murdering sociopath. And at the same time, we should not provoke him and let the Ukraine make their own decisions, but not encourage them to come into NATO. And we should have taken NATO off the table. It's pretty clear that that would have been a, a better uh, decision here. But we we still can't think of an exit ramp here, which and I don't hear well, it's Putin talking possible. about it's, Putin has never said I want X. Well, right? no, I think you know, there, there have been times where he well, I mean, look, I think his demands, his demands have been a non starter with us. I think at this point, he wants Crimea, he wants the Donbass to be independent, maybe uh, under the suzerainty of, of Russia, some of protectorate, basically. Uh, and he's talked about this uh, denazification, demilitarization of Ukraine. I mean, so now I think the demands are escalated because they're at war. And he's lost too much. He needs to get more. Right. I mean, part of the the, the problem is you're saying he's stuck. And he needs to No, I think once you've you know, once you've invested a hundred dollars, you got to make one hundred fifty back. Whereas before he had invested ten dollars, he would have been happy taking fifty out. You know, and I think at this point he's put too much in to walk out with the same sort of deal, you know, he was looking at What are at the before. chances he's overplayed his hand? Like the economic cost at this point to him, the loss of jobs, the loss of customers, the loss of the value of his currency. I mean, you add all this stuff up, uh, so much has been taken away. It's very hard to see him coming, feeling like he can come out of this thing ahead. And so he's only going to keep plowing forward. D does he face the risk of ruin, Chamath? I mean, is this like at this point, well, his concept we'll here in 2020, Russian GDP was $1.483 trillion. Now, what percentage of that do you think is actually exports versus a domestic economy? Let's say half. Let's be, just take a guess, right? So you're talking about $750 billion of exports. So um, let's just say that, you know, between the BOJ, uh, Bank of Canada, ECB, and the Federal Reserve, um, we all just collectively printed $5 trillion. You can absorb many, many years of Russia's export loss. Now, it does have some gnarly implications. You know, you probably have to work more closely, for example, with Iran. You have to get an Iran nuclear deal done. Why? So that we can get access to their oil, right? So it blunts the loss of the, of the Russian reserves, as an example. You know, we'd have to do um, some clever things on sustainability and farming. My point is, though, that I think the economic calculus of this decision is not as grandiose as it once may have seemed post a COVID scenario where we were printing, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a month. I think there's a, a the only good news I can take from this axe is, you know, the, the free world has now learned about what a dependency like we've literally woken up from the delusion that oh, we sorry, can intertwine. Jason. Hold on, let me just finish this one statement yeah. and I want to get your feedback on it. We have woken up from a delusion that we can intertwine our economies with rich and nuclear powered dictators in communist countries, both China and Russia. And now I think the great decoupling and the great independence is upon us with us moving semiconductors back on shore, 
going nuclear, maybe I, fracking seems, I think even any environmentalist will take fracking in Europe, fracking in the United States over a dependency over a dictator. So is that 100%. not a silver lining here? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's so obvious now to everybody that we need to be energy independent, that it was insane for us to throw away that energy independence, we've restricted it. I think that if there was a bill introduced, and I think uh, it's being talked about to uh, repeal all the restrictions on fracking, it would pass the Senate 75-25, meaning all the Republicans would vote for it and half the Democrats would vote for it. So I think everybody's on board now. And there is some remarkable, uh, you see the tweets from Michael Schellenberger about it. It has come out that, you know who is backing all the these- anti-fracking. <laughs> yeah, the anti-fracking environmental <laughs> movement- in, in Russia, in, 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 in Europe. Europe. And they fell exactly. for it. And they fell for it. Exactly. And the so Germans fell for it and turned off nuclear. And now all of a sudden, they're dependent on Russia. And he has the pretext to now invade. Right. These environmental groups in, in Europe have been useful idiots for Putin and the Kremlin. Yeah, that's what that's what's so sad. I think I saw a tweet. It was something uh, to the effect that 25 years ago or 30 years ago, Europe actually produced more liquefied natural gas for Europe than Russia did. And the whole thing flipped because all these environmentalists forced they outsourced Europe to shut their down. Guilt. They outsourced their guilt. But it turned out that all, a lot of those organizations may have been funded by Russia to basically Brilliant. affect that change. I wanted to say something, Jason, before. You know, there's a common thing that you hear right now, which is, oh, economic sanctions don't work. And I just wanted to talk about that for one second. Which is, I think, I, th I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of chatter that historically economic sanctions aren't enough, which is why you can't draw a very clear, bright line between that and military intervention as well. And I thought, and I, as I thought about it, this is why I, I think you can actually fight an economic battle and an economic conflict without it pulling you into a military one. And the reason is actually because of what's happened in the last 40 or 50 years. You know, you have like the the most critical infrastructure in the world, I think, is the financial infrastructure, whether we like it or not, right? Because, you know, energy infrastructure tends to be more localized, other forms of infrastructure are localized. But the one real asset that is absolutely global and universal is the financial payments infrastructure. And, you know, what has really happened is that you can really cripple a country or an entity when you blacklist them from these organizations and these networks. And so this is why I actually think people underestimate the severity of, um, of economic sanctions if done correctly. And I think before, you've never really, other than, you know, Venezuela and a couple of other, you know, North Korea. North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela. Cuba, you've never really explored the totality and the impact of this kind of sanctions on a large global actor. Which we're this now is almost greater than sanctions. You're being you're not allowed to participate. It's not even like you're saying you can't export this, you can't import this. It's you're now not allowed. You have no seat at the table. I think the crude oil example and the airline industry example are two incredible examples of the ripple effects of these sanctions, right? So again, just to reiterate, like if you're a European based refiner, in order for you to go and buy that oil, you may have, you know, a working capital line from a German bank. Well, that would violate the terms of that bank now. And so you can't go and get that, right? If you actually have that oil on hand, and you refine it into gasoline, and you want to put it into the open market, and you call Flexport as an example and say, help me get this stuff to XYZ location or Maersk or somebody else, they won't do it. I mean, and right? you look at the tech sanctions that have started, it sounds minor, but you have Netflix is pulled out of the country, Apple is not selling products in the country, Google is starting to restrict services in the company. A and this is going to have a massive impact on their ability to just participate in society. They just turned off proactively this morning. I don't know if you saw that it was right as we were getting on air. Uh, Facebook's been banned. Instagram is still on Twitter still on but the Russians now are, are turning off information into the country while every other country, uh, every other company is turning off their services there. I think the global economy or not even the global economy. I think Japan, Europe, Canada, America can collectively support five, six, seven trillion dollars of subsidies to blunt the economic impact of these sanctions. That's effectively shutting Russian exports off for eight, nine, ten years. Think about the the so. You know, th th this, this is, that is the damage. Any thoughts here as we 
kind of come to no way out here and just well, the Russian I mean, I think, economy can, can being I, decoupled? I say, so so I, I think that if we're going to figure out a way out, we need to assess what our objectives, you know, what our objectives are. And we talked earlier on, on, on the show about this idea of regime change and that there wouldn't be an answer without regime change. I disagree with that. Um, I, you know, just those two words, regime change, should make everybody cringe because regime change was the justification for the Iraq war, for Afghanistan, for Libya, for Syria. And every single one of those things has been a disaster. When has the United States of America successfully achieved regime change in the last 20 years without creating enormous blowback? There's an assumption that somehow if Putin gets toppled by an internal coup, that we end up with Gorbachev 2.0. Well, maybe we do. It's a maybe, we, maybe we end up with a hardliner who's even worse. I don't, you know, I don't. And I, and so I what think, should the goal be? Uh, obviously, regime change would be wonderful if the Russian people chose that. But what, what is the is I'd peace? Say ceasefire. Ceasefire, ceasefire and peace, right? Yeah, I agree. Ceasefire. Um, so I think Putin miscalculated the resolve of Zelensky and the West. You know, Zelensky was like this TV actor who became president. He was very, before this, he was like 25% popularity. Now he's at 90 something percent. I think Putin underestimated his resolve. He Would you say Putin has the lost the information war? I mean, that, that's oh, pretty yeah, staggering. Uh, yes. I mean, it's pretty clear that Putin it's, thought he could win this information war. And this is the first meme. I don't even see him the trying. first meme war. Yeah, I, I agree. It is a meme war. I think we're being heavily propagandized. Um, but if but the I West mean, is winning the propaganda war. But well, Jake, how, it's look not at, just look, the West. Look, look, look at, yeah, but I mean, look at where you're sitting, right? Ukraine is engaged in that effort too, right? Sure. I mean, yeah. you had you had the whole Snake Island thing, where basically the um, you know the did that wind up being confirmed as fake news? That was fake. Okay, yeah. you had Snake yeah. Island, where the 13 Ukrainian soldiers said we're going to we're going to yeah. bring us death rather than surrender. It turns out they actually surrendered. You had the old woman walking up to the Russian soldiers with Tell her- to get the hell out of snake. here. Yeah, exactly. That, that was, was fake. a fake. Um, what else? I mean, I think this- Everything's the, fake. This man. Chernobyl 2.0 was fake. Oh, the- um, Well, the, that was The, the fighter fake. pilot. The fighter yeah. pilot was the, the ghost The ghost of, of Kiev. Uh, yeah, exactly. That turned out to be a fake. So look, we are being heavily propagandized. Now, I don't blame Zelensky or the Ukrainians for trying to propagandize us because yeah, they're, they're a the small right country fighting for their lives. And if they can pull us into the war, it- would help them. It might also cause World War Three, or just win hearts and minds, and and you know flip Russian sentiment. There's something else that's really interesting. I just went to uh, the World Bank site just to check um, whether the GDP number that I just gave you was right, and it is right. But what's even more interesting is that Russian GDP has actually decayed 35 percent in the last decade. It what it peaked in 2013 at 2.292 trillion dollars. And so, and all the way down to now 1.483. So I think the point is with, you know, all of these other things that they've been having to deal with because of their foreign adventurism, um, you've seen a contraction of their economy already. Freeberg, did we over, did the West and everybody overestimate uh, Russia's capabilities here? I mean, is that a possibility? Because they seem like they're getting beaten pretty, uh, or they're, they're being fought back at a way people didn't think they would be able to. First of all, I have no friggin' clue. Second of yeah. all, I don't know like what people think that they thought they knew or do or don't know. But I think importantly, we don't really know what's going on over there. You know, we are hearing stories every day that we feel is conclusive and factual and on the ground reporting. And then a few hours later, we find out may or may not actually be true. You know, I, this is the fog of war. And I wouldn't take anything that I'm reading on Twitter or seeing on CNN or hearing some commentator from the United States making some comment about, nor would I feel the same about any commentator in the Ukraine or Russia or anywhere else for that matter. Facts are going to be facts. I'm not sure facts are necessarily going to get to us. And so I don't know what's going on the ground with Russia. There's a convoy, supposedly, that we know we can see from satellite imagery that's moving towards Kiev. It's stopped. We don't know why it stopped. There's claims by one group of people that says they're out of food and they're defecting. There's claims by another group of people that say they're waiting to encircle the city and then command pressure and use this as leverage effectively to try and get a good negotiated deal to exit. We don't know. And so, you know, for us to be like, you know, four guys commentating at Starbucks, I think is a bit of a mistake because there's very few facts that we can't actually say is objectively true at this point. Now, um, what we do know is <laughs> Russia has a lot of nukes. 
And so regardless of what's going on the ground with tactical stuff, you know, any sort of assumption that leads to our belief that an alternative intervention or, or some other force can ultimately win against Russia uh, is, is completely false because Russia has thousands of nuclear warheads. And, um, you know, if, if Russia wanted to exert its military authority over anyone in the world, they can. And, um, and so I wouldn't kind of take any of this stuff um, that Russia is going to lose a war, uh, you know, a, a, a war on the ground in the Ukraine. I mean, at the end of the day, they've got the ultimate trump card. Well, and also they haven't brought out the heavy, the heavy. They, they've got I mean, bombers. They can, I mean, yes, they, they can they, bomb got bombers. Kiev got those, into rubble. Okay, they've got those they can, bunker they can, buster they can, bombs. They've got stuff that. Yeah, what is the strategy from? here to just listen? They can pull a Grozny. They can pull a Fallujah. I mean, look, you know, we they, we can, they can a, 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 a Dresden. Let's not pretend like we haven't done it too. They can bomb these cities into rubble from the sky and they're that not is, they're because it would be JK, too bad we don't, you know they're, 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 the blowback they're, would be too bad from the west we I don't know we don't know but there's certainly, know. there's certainly a strategy these guys aren't a bunch of idiots scrambling around trying to figure out what to do they've got the second most powerful military on planet earth that can literally destroy every human on planet earth they are they are pretty smart and they're going to figure something out to get themselves some sort of an advantage ultimately what that is we don't know you know we're sitting here trying to no. figure out how to play chess when we've well, never played it before. I mean, Sachs, th that might be something worth discussing. I mean, there is a contingent that say, listen, Putin isn't thinking about this strictly logically. Yeah, I, I understand that point of view. Uh, you hear it a lot on, on the press. What do you think? Here's what I would, well, here's what I think is I think Putin underestimated uh, Zelensky's resolve, Ukrainian resolve, and I'd say the West resolve. I think it would be a mistake, however, for us to underestimate his resolve yeah and uh that's what i'm afraid of next is that he doesn't want to give up um and listen to go back to to you know the mearsheimer point so there's a school of realism and what mearsheimer says and he predicted a lot of this so you have it's to, amazing yeah he, he gave a great talk in 2015 right. i watched it um right before we got on air right one of the ways we'll I put it I in assess, the show notes yeah one of the ways i i assess who i want to listen to and learn more from is when i see someone making farsighted predictions that come true i'm like okay, pretty good one yeah yeah exactly you're like okay this guy has a mental model that seems to predict the world right i mean like Karl popper said famously that the difference between science and religion is that science makes predictions that are falsifiable if you make predictions one prediction after another that ends up becoming true maybe you have a way of thinking about the world that is predictive so this guy i, I would just say I, I can't summarize all of his thinking here but i would just say i mean i went down kind of a rabbit hole on YouTube, just watching his stuff. I, obviously, not all of it is right. Okay. But, and, but, you know, the media has been demonizing this guy because for the few things he's gotten wrong about the situation, instead of all the things he's gotten right. And, you know, if you were to do the Washington establishment by the same standard, they've gotten far more wrong than he has, especially over, you know, since the Iraq war over the last 20 years. But anyway, the point he makes is simply this, or one of the points is, listen, this situation in Ukraine, is to the Russians what the Cuban Missile Crisis was to us, meaning it is not a pretext for Putin to go in and expand his empire. What is really going on here is they have defined this as a red line they see as a vital national security interest. And so we should be thinking about them and their resolve the way that we thought about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So in other words, the Russians are acting like the Americans did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And remember, Fidel Castro thought he had the sovereignty. He thought he had the, the right to go make a treaty and a deal with whoever he wanted. And he went to the, freely went to the, to the Soviet Union to try and make a deal. And the Americans said, no way. And, you not know, we imposed, backyard. not in our backyard. And we imposed a blockade and we were flying the bombers. And Kennedy had advisors and generals who were willing to go to nuclear war to win that standoff and that confrontation. And, Ultimately, the way that they solve the problem is JFK sent Bobby Kennedy to go secretly cut a deal with the Russians to pull the Jupiter missiles, the warheads out of Turkey. So there's a quid pro quo. They kept it secret for six months. Kennedy got to declare a, a, a victory, but the, the Russians, the Soviets got something out of it too. They were able to defuse the situation. So if there's any way to make a deal like that, I think it would be a good idea. Yeah, I mean, the reason, don't, don't you think the reason is. he's, yeah. don't you think the reason, Sachs, that he is misunderstood is because we are propagating democracy. And when we do something, 
well, it has the shine of, hey, we want people to be free. We want individual freedom. We want individual human rights. We want individual expression. These things are the height of human existence. And when communist countries do it, well, they're trying to spread communism and authoritarianism and reduce humans, uh, individualism and freedoms. And, and that is a valid argument. But he says in his talks, like, listen, you can put that aside and just say, you know, missiles in your backyard, not good. Yeah, exactly. So this is the, the fundamental dichotomy in, in sort of the in foreign policy thinking or international relations is between idealism and, and realism. Idealism says it's all about values. And so we're going around the world, we're promoting democracy, we're supporting allies who we think will spread democracy. There's good guys and bad guys, we're on the sides of the good guys. And that's who we support and we change the regimes that are the bad guys. But the realists think of this as great power rivalry. And we have to understand the way that great powers have always reacted and behaved. And great powers, whether it's Russia or the Soviet Union or us, will behave viciously and ruthlessly towards anything they perceive as a threat to their national security interest, their vital national security interests. What are your thoughts on this being the moment we, we make the next big transition? We were in a bipolar world order. We've been in unipolar for the majority of our lifetimes where we only experienced the United States. And now, is this the moment we move to multipolar sex where we're going to, or have we moved there already? It's, uh, it's, it's, there's a transition that's happening mainly because of China. So right. we're in, I, you know, it seems like what we're doing is pushing Russia irrevocably into, into, into Xi's arms. He's going to be a part huge of, mistake. It's part of that. Well, I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that, Jay Cal. Well, I said it two weeks ago. I, I mean, I said this sounds, crazy but if we could get putin to be you know in talks with us then he's not in talks with xi jinping and when you saw him with you know taking pictures with xi jinping that should have been a red alarm bell to everybody that our foreign policy is not working because if he's talking to xi jinping supposedly and who knows if this is true again fog of war to freeberg's point you know maybe xi jinping told him can you wait till after the olympics to do this invasion if they're coordinating at that level that's really problematic for the US. We need him on our side. We need to get Pakistan on our side, India, South Korea. We need to build an alliance to deal with the eventuality of China going into the South China Sea and taking over Taiwan. So Chamath, what are your thoughts on does this give Xi Jinping a window or not? And is there any path to getting Russia back in uh, talks with the West? Maybe he can help get them uh, restarted in a way that could normalize relations. This is, uh, well, it, the, the real question is like, if you're Xi, do you look at this and say, uh, it emboldens me or I have to be even more strategic and crafty? What do you think? I say the latter. Yeah. Yeah. It's the latter, right? If Russia had rolled. Right. It'd be the this former. Is one good, this is one good thing. And I'll, I'll sort of contradict what I said a little bit before. Look, I, I, I don't, I'm not passionately attached to either the realist or the idealist school of thinking. I think they're interesting. We need to consider both perspectives. What I would say is that the resilience, the ferocity of the Ukrainians, the resistance, defending themselves, giving Putin a punch in the nose, we can all support that because we know that Xi is watching. And if he sees, wow, the Russians really got a tough time with the Ukrainians, what, you know, am I going to be facing a similar situation with Taiwan? And what's interesting is that the way the Ukrainians, they basically were willing to arm every man, woman, and I don't know, child, but every man and woman there, they were handing out the AK-47s. Basically, they Israelized, right? You want to know how Israel has survived in a neighborhood where everyone wants to kill them? Every single adult serves in the army and they get guns. It's like, you know, They're Second Amendment over there. Forced. forced yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So, I think that the Ukrainians have shown a model that's really based on the Israel model, which is, listen, if Taiwan really wants to be independent, every adult there needs to learn how to fight and they need to have, have weapons. And that's going to be the best guarantor. We can be their ally, but that's going to be the best guarantor is creating a credible deterrent to Xi moving on them. I mean, I, do we transition to another story here? I mean, this is, this is one of the problems <laughs> when we're living in these kind of times is that if you talk about anything other than this when the decision thing, trees can go, I saw a tweet when all the decision trees can go to zero, meaning that like there's a 1% chance of or 0.1% or 0.01% chance of, of war three, the nuclear war, then yeah, it's yeah. hard to talk about anything else hard to think about anything else. So yeah. Um, 
I watched Ozarks this week. <laughs> Boy, amazing. Uh, is that great good? Series. Ozark? Is that good? I like, Ozark I mean, is great. The, the Jason Bateman, season, amazing. Yeah, great Jason performances. Bateman is so freaking good on it. Um, Breaking Bad 2.0. I that series twice, and I've fallen asleep in episode one yeah. both times. No, no, no. You, it, you, you got to keep going. It rolls. It's, it's, it's basically Breaking Bad 2.0. Yeah. Phenomenal. I, uh, I started season two of Euphoria. Oh, oh yeah. my lord! Oh that my is lord. ever let your kids watch it. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Well, it's either that or it's like the best deterrent. So like right, you totally. sit, you make them sit and watch it, and they'll not only will they never not do drugs, but like they'll they just won't do anything. They'll just like this stay is, in the house. It, it's scarring. It's basically oh. Requiem for a Dream meets like Disney Plus afternoons. Like I, these are Disney stars living in Requiem for a Dream. Do I, not watch it. I need it. to decompress after I watch it. If you have kids, it's terrorizing. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. It's scarring. It's very artistic, too, I have to say. I give them a lot Should of Should we talk about markets? I mean, you know, I feel like yeah. there's a yeah, really let's go to kind of markets. important yeah. discussion because the markets are so volatile during these kind of volatile information times, times of, you know, information that's changing day to day, intraday. You know, where do you guys think about kind of spending your time right now? Or are you kind of just putting your head in the sand and saying, we'll pull it out afterwards. I mean, how do you guys kind of, yep. I mean, well, what's funny is like, I sax is curled up in a ball, <laughs> you know, in, in, in times of, in times of uncertainty, you actually want to be deploying. So, you know, uh, I announced, what was it last week? I think it was the solar deal, the solar deal. You know, I put $228 million into this thing. And then I did another deal. I put 45 million bucks into this thing. You guys know about which we haven't announced yet. Yep. So, um, but other than that, I've been literally uh, white knuckled. Uh, I don't like to open the stock app. There's oh. no point. Okay. <laughs> Take some dramamine yeah, before you app. open your Morgan Stanley the account. stock app. The stock app. And it, what's, what's so funny is like my Bloomberg terminal, which is right beside me here at my desk. I have not logged into it. Okay. <laughs> Put it in a drawer. Unplug it. Yeah. There's just no point. I, at the end of every week, I get a report, right? Kind of like our PL. And I just look at the top line. Like Connor always sends me the top line is like, you know, and and the last like eight weeks in a row, we've lost one percent. We've lost two percent. We've lost three percent. The time that it Sachs was like wishes he lost one percent. Yeah. I celebrated. I got so drunk that night. I was like, <laughs> finally. <laughs> this is where it it really does help, right, Sachs, to think There's in decades. Like, if you think in decades and you th you're a venture investor, you can kind of just put the stuff out of your mind, which is what what I'm doing. And the great thing is. I'm seeing amazing companies, great founders, deals are taking longer to close, people are starting to do diligence again, and people are discussing what the right valuation for this early stage startup is, which is good. That's healthy. I think we're getting like, I don't know what you're seeing in the in the early to mid stage market privately, but I'm seeing really healthy discussions and late stage madness is gone. It's over. Yeah, I mean, I think 100 times ARR is over, but we no one really knows where it's landing. So I'm seeing some, some deals get done at 60 to 80 times, but um, no one really knows where it, it should be, you know? I sent you guys this tweet from Morgan Housel, who is a great guy. And he has this fabulous tweet. He says, the sh he, he, it says, the, sh the shock cycle. And it's this beautiful cycle. Assume good news is permanent, oblivious to bad news. Then you ignore the bad news. Then you deny the bad news. <laughs> then you panic at the bad news. But then you accept the bad news. And then you ignore the good news. You deny the good news. You accept the good news. And then you assume the good news is permanent. That starts the cycle. If I, if I could just put it out there, I don't know today if you guys saw non-farm payrolls, but we had a huge print in um, unemployment, like really great print, meaning like a lot of employers were able to find people to take jobs. It was a big number. But the interesting thing about it was we didn't see uh, wage inflation tick up with it. And if I had to look at that, and if you actually look at a bunch of the earnings reports that have come out in the last three or four weeks, I actually think we're in the part of the cycle here where we're starting to ignore the good news. And we're so negative, and we're so emotionally wrapped up in everything, that people forget that actually the world tends to um, keep moving forward, right? Um, we are not in World War Three by any measure. Are we in not? We are not anywhere near that. Okay. And so I th just think it's important for people to take a step back and take a really deep breath. But I think that there's a lot of good news out there. There's a ton of good news. And for people who don't know the term, and we're ignoring. For people it. Who don't know the term print. When we say there's a print, 
that is just a colloquialism in the financial markets that something was formatted for printing previously and you got good news. So an official report is sometimes called we got to print. I agree with I think what's going on is there is some underlying good news, right? But there's this overhead of a small chance of something catastrophic happening. So how do you price that in, right? It's 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 uh an, it's like a one outer, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But this it's this guy it's can like hit quads, we're set over set. Yeah. It's a one hour to one outer to the apocalypse, basically. If basically. that tiny probability thing happens, the the game is over. So, you know, why so even worry? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't right? matter. Like it doesn't matter. So you're, you're, the cost happen. of your house doesn't matter if there's a nuclear war. That's right. Th this is this is the thing that people underestimate is like that's not a that's not a risk that one should be hedging in any way financially right at that point the only thing that matters is the health and safety of your family and your friends but really your immediate family like can you take care of them and make sure they're safe and so you know if you're if you're an investor in the financial markets or you're building a company managing for that externality in my opinion i'm not sure makes a ton of sense because i don't think you can manage to that externality it's, you have no impact on it's it it's cataclysmic it's, it's something it's, completely it's an out of your control scenario yeah so i think you have to manage to the 99.999 percent of normalized outcomes and i think right now there are some what's called green shoots meaning like some positive news in the world and some positive data by the way the other thing that we saw today was or this week was jerome powell and you know, the Jerome Powell testimony was also in the middle of massive amounts of bad news. Some actually pretty decent good news, which was, he said he's going to raise by 25 basis points in March, everybody knew that, right? So we took the 50 basis pointer off the table. But then he was very clear that they were going to be data driven. And in the language of the Federal Reserve, what that essentially means is like, we're going to be patient and wait and see. And if you couple it with what I said before, which is the economic cost of these economic sanctions towards Russia can be calculated. And I think that we have proven a willingness to print capital and money. And so if you put those two things together, I think there could be a real possibility that Powell becomes very accommodative. And you know, he and Biden and the entire administration come together with Europe and everybody else and say, get the money printer back going because we are we're going to stand the line on these economic sanctions. And we're going to, you know, sort of soft land the economy here because we think there's recessionary risks afoot. Let me just provide a, a, a little bit of a counterpoint, which is where I'm most concerned. We don't know what the repercussions are fully in a dynamical system of global capital of pulling out this much capital and devaluing assets at this scale so quickly. The shock to the system, I don't think, has yet been realized. And I think we'll know at the end of this month when books close, what things actually do to businesses, to swap agreements, to trades, you know, uh, trade balances that are outstanding. And you could talk about economic stimulus as being the way to solve that. But we don't yet know what's broken. And they're like, like, let me just give you guys another example. Today, corn, I think is trading at 760 a bushel. That hasn't happened, guys, I can't tell you in how long. This was a commodity that was trading at 350 a few months ago. And so we're now talking about that, the trickle down effect of that price into the beef. The trickle down effect is we're already seeing in California where the, or San Francisco where the average price per gallon of gas at over $5. The trickle down effect on, um, uh, on purchasing behavior, on businesses defaulting because uh, suddenly their, their counterparties dry up. We don't know, and we won't know, and it's well, not actually, just actually, we about, know some of those. We know some of them, but we don't yeah. know what we don't know. And the thing I'm okay, concerned sure. about is this is, a, imagine, when I say dynamical system from a physics perspective, it's like, take a hundred slinkies and tie them together into a giant graph of slinkies. And you start punching one of the slinkies like this. If you punch one or two of the slinkies hard enough, you don't know how the repercussions will cause a slinky all the way over there to suddenly shoot up or shoot down. But, there yeah, but are, you're also denying your ability to change a different slinky. That's the whole point of a dynamic sure, system. Sure, could, you could put energy back into it, but we don't know what's broken. And there could be something that's irreparably we've gone broken. Through these, we've gone through these things before. And I think you're not learning from history or you're at least not willing to admit it. But no, I, I think it, we've seen Hold on a second. We seen yeah. it in TARP. Okay, we did not know the total extent of what happened in the GFC. And we had to invent a financial framework to soft land the global economy. We figured it out. When we went through LTCM and John Merriweather blew up. Explain what that is. There was a huge hedge fund in the late 90s that basically had a, a massively levered exposure to the financial markets. 
to the tune of like tens or tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. Go read the book When Genius Failed if you want to read the story. It's a, it's a, it does a good job summarizing it, but it's a, it's a great story. Yeah, go ahead. And again, we had to step in uh, with a governmental framework and a broad infrastructure of actors across the world to soft land the financial economy in a way, not knowing what the actual, uh, what, what part was broken. So I, I just fundamentally disagree with this idea that we're running blind. Yeah, look, we're we talking about, I'm talking about capital and energy and food. And some combination of those things are going to cause some serious deleterious effects on people okay, well, I think and on markets. And look, I, I get it, Chamath. I, I know that there's solutions for repair. And I know that we're going to act swiftly and aggressively. And every time, by the way, I just want to point out, in each of those scenarios you've talked about, we've acted more swiftly and more aggressively than we did in the scenario prior. And it's getting to the point that, you know, what is the value? How much debt, how much deficit are we really willing to take on? Everyone obviously has these kind of, you know, in intrinsic existential questions about how much we really can act long term without the dollar collapsing. But certainly in the context of a global economy collapsing, the dollar will always be the safe haven. But there are other things at play here, like you know, the cost of gas for the average American, you know, the, 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 the amount of wheat and the amount of food that people in Africa are going to have. Access what you're to what you're saying here, Freeberg, is that some of these things we have been through. And if you look at gas as one example, I think you're bringing up the important ones here, food and energy gas, we actually know what happens when gas prices go up. We saw that not long ago, people bought more hybrids, and the miles per gallon per car uh you know when you raise prices consumption goes down and Those people get creative adjustments jake i'm talking about the short-term acute effects the thing that america has the ability to do is they have the ability to change the financial incentives for actors all around the world in a split second and behavior can change and and so i actually think freeberg the nuanced thing that you're saying which i completely agree with but maybe we should say more explicitly is it probably is a reasonable way to manage risk in america europe Canada, Japan. But what's going to be very, very difficult is the impact that this has on emerging markets in Southeast Asia, Asia, Africa could be really, really deleterious for some amount of time. And, and sad. And it's a human, it's going to cause a humanitarian problem. It's really friggin sad. And it's, you know, whatever progress has been made could be unwound. I think you're right. By the way, I think I think that that is actually really the risk that I think, um, holding the line on these sanctions really does it pushes the risk towards em countries and then i think we're going to have to figure out what our moral resolve is to go and fix those and that's my point earlier which is we're going to bear the cost ultimately the united states is going to have to step up in a really outsized way to solve this problem and while we might not be sending troops on the ground we're going to end up paying several trillion dollars i don't know that it's going to be just the united states freeberg the united states seems to be working in coordination with our Whatever allies is, JK, in this like situation day, we're not we're acting have, unilaterally yeah, anymore that's a good news we're going to have an economic cost, right? There's going to be some me, there's 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 no amount of money that you can actually put on human life. And so if we can avoid a military war, I just think that there's just there's there's no red line on cost there. And so if we end up running massive deficits and now we're at, you know, 150 250 300% of GDP, uh, I think that, you know, morally, that's, that is the right thing to do. Sachs, is, is, uh, is the world becoming that's more idealistic and realistic? Let me bring Sachs in here. Sachs, is the world becoming more anti fragile slash resilient, pick one of the two, I guess, to these kind of upending events because of COVID because of China pulling out of financial markets, we just went through this Freeberg was like, Hey, this is unprecedented. Actually, I think we have a little bit of a precedent here. We have the complete shutdown of the economy from COVID in recent memory. And we have China deciding that all these companies are no longer public. We've seen they did their own economic sanctions. They sanctioned themselves and pulled out of markets. So what do you think, Sex? I mean, I think the current crisis is a reminder that it's not uh, too anti-fragile. I think we are in a transition. We've the, the Cold War ended about 30 years ago. And since then, we've been in engaging in this sort of unipolar foreign policy where America calls all the shots. Now, the world is becoming more multipolar. I'm not sure it's all the way there yet. And you have countries like Russia and China reasserting themselves. And that's making the world a more dangerous place. Well, you also have the EU working together in unison, and they seem to be maybe they're going to become a bigger actor here because of this, right? We're seeing them take a, that, a bigger that was sort of a, a positive surprise, yeah. as long as they don't pull a Franz Ferdinand like 
Freeberg yeah. said and inadvertently blunder us into the war, into a war. Okay, folks, this is this week in dystopian <laughs> outcomes. No, no, let's talk about something good. Come on. Another good news. Let's talk, some good news here. let's talk about the big CAR-T breakthrough this week. There is good news, guys. Good news is there. there. Must we be. Just well, the good news is that we're managing um, crises after crises. China Freeberg, crises. You want, to, you want to tell people about this revolutionary breakthrough? In I cancer? mean, look, there's just there was another CAR T therapy uh, approved. Two of them approved in the last week for um, myeloma CAR T. Just I think we've talked about it in the past. You know, every human body has um, T cells. They're a core part of your immune system. T cells are programmed, so they have a, a sensor, uh, you know, that, that tells them where to go and what to destroy. And so as T cells learn what to destroy, you know, they can be really effective at, at clearing bad things out of your body, clearing pathogens and, and invasive things out of your body. And so a few years ago, uh, you know, humans gained the ability to engineer T cells by adding the genetic code to a T cell, effectively engineering it to go after a very specific thing. And so the big uh, revolution in CAR T therapies has been in oncology and cancer. So, uh, you know, programmed T cells to destroy specific cancer cells in the body that, you know, you would historically have had to use really difficult, systemically challenging drugs like uh, chemotherapies and so on to wipe out lots of cells. And in many cases, doesn't eradicate all the cancer. And CAR T turns out it can be extremely effective at finding very specific cancer cells in your body. And in many cases, causing complete remission in cancer. And so, you know, there was one um, CAR T that was approved that showed, I believe it was an 88 or 90% complete remission in multiple myeloma, which is a form of blood cancer. So they, they take your T cells out of your body. Uh, you, you just get a little blood draw, basically. Uh, they go in a lab. Uh, they're zapped with electricity, which uh, causes them to open up slightly and an engineered, a little CRISPR edit happens. And those, uh, those cells are now edited, the DNA in those cells is edited. And now those cells know to go after the cancer target, you put them back in your body after they grow up for a few days, and they filter them and test them, make sure they're safe. And after they go back in your body, the, the T cells go to work and they clear all the cancer cells out of your body. It's an incredible technology, incredible, incredible technology. cell based therapies are unbelievable. The is the name of the company involved in this A2 bio? Is that the no A2 headline? did something else? No. So that breakthrough was even even more important, I think, in the long term. What he's talking about is Janssen and Legend uh, are the two companies that basically got approval from the FDA. Now, the thing with CAR-T is like, you know, CAR-T has been incredibly um, believed in blood-based cancers, right? But that's an entire category that excludes solid tumor cancers. Um, what you're talking about, Jason, this week as well, what happened was A2Bio basically figured out how to modify these T-cells in a way where you can actually attack and target a very specific solid tumor. So there's a lot more work for those guys. But if you play that out, now you have this incredible ability for your own body to be trained to fight and kill cancer, whether it's in your blood or whether it's the solid tumors. Huh. Now, the, the, pri the, pr the price of these therapies today, they're, they're charging, call it 400 to $450,000 per treatment. And by the way, the treatment it's a one time shot. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? The, yeah, they pull the blood out of your body. They and then the, the, the expensive challenging part is how do you take the cells, isolate them, engineer them, test them, screen them, make sure they're safe. The way that is done today is very expensive and time consuming because the volume is low. And there haven't been as many kind of engineering breakthroughs. How long over does the last it take? You know? It takes months, a, uh, it can take a week to four weeks. So before you For get one yourself, person, 10 people, is it the equipment that's expensive? Oh, no, no. What's like I, I actually, um, I invited Chamath to come with me, we went and visited one of these labs a few weeks ago. But I, I won't get into it. Um, but it is it, it, it's unnecessarily inefficient in the sense that you can charge so much because when you spend half a million dollars to treat a cancer patient, you just save yourself millions of dollars in long term care for that cancer patient. Uh, so the price is determined by the That's alternative how a lot of cost are priced is like, mm -hmm. how do you uh, save money over the long run for the payer, you know, the insurance company. And so if the if the insurance company knows over the long run, they're going to pay $3 million in care for this cancer, this type of cancer they're totally willing to spend half a million dollars to, you know, to, to, to end the cancer. Is that the right financial calculus for this? So here's the thing. So if you look at the actual cost of doing this, there is a university in the Bay Area, that is doing um, uh, CAR T therapies, and their cost is about forty grand. They built their own lab to do this, Got it. And, and that, by the way, is also extremely inefficient. We, I think, that over the long run, we can get the cost of cell therapies below five thousand bucks. And when you can do that, by the way, CAR T can be used not just to go after cancer, but you can get it to go after autoimmunity. 
So people with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, there are known B cells in your body that are making antibodies that are causing the inflammation in your body, destroying your own body. And so down the road, we could use CAR T to destroy um, lupus, to destroy antibodies, uh, uh, B cells that are producing antibodies that are, um, you know, fundamentally causing autoimmune conditions, including what we talked about a few weeks ago, multiple sclerosis, given that we now have a strong belief that if you can get rid of uh, the EBV, the uh, Epstein-Barr virus uh, from your body, uh, you can wipe that out. So, so CAR T can in the long run be harnessed not just for cancer, but autoimmunity and potentially other pathogens in the body in a really targeted way. And this, this is kind of the beginning of what will likely be a multi decade kind of new therapeutic modality that's that's, you know, accelerating. I had I a question think, for you Chimato, think, though, on the on the pricing model here of hey, uh, the way we price this is how much are we saving the insurer? Is that too much price optimization? Is there a better model here? I have no idea. Um, okay, I would like to talk about something else. Uh, related okay. to this, Jason, <laughs> there's this massive patent battle going on for oh, CRISPR. CRISPR. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's worth J Cal if you can give just a two second primer, because I think we should talk about patents just for a second. And you know, yeah, okay. there are there's the extreme version, which is what Elon has done. And then there's the other extreme version, which is these two folks sure. fighting over what so could be a critical obviously life Elon technology. has gone with putting the patents out making his patents open source and putting them out there and using them as a deterrent, uh, like nuclear weapons have been. But the US Patent and Trademark Office published uh, a ruling on Monday in favor of MIT and Harvard over Berkeley, the ruling cancels certain patent applications made by the University of California and its partners regarding a CRISPR system known as CRISPR CAS9. 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 The ruling states that they failed to provide persuasive evidence that they got the gene editing technology to work before the broad group did. The central question in dispute is which group got to the CRISPR CAS9 tool. Basically, the whole thing here, Jason, is yeah. like there was a group led by these two incredible uh, scientists who they won uh, the Nobel Prize, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. They're Berkeley and uh, and she uh, Emmanuel, I think is she's at a, a university in Germany, I think. But then there was a, a different team trying to develop a system for CRISPR Cas9 from MIT, uh, Harvard at the Broad. And they all filed patents on top of each other. And this whole thing was a thing. And, you know, um, the, the big implication of all this is what are companies supposed to do? Right? Because if you are a company that wants to build a CRISPR Cas9 gene editing thing, look, there's a lot of situations where uh, a single point edit or a broad edit can have a meaningful change in your health. So these are businesses that should exist. You didn't know what to do because if you license the IP from the wrong person, you'd get sued. Right. And many companies now are like trying to license both sets of patents. And I just think to me, it frustrated me when I read this article. Um, and, you know, this is the conversation I had with you guys in the group chat is I think we need to think of and imagine a new way for patents to work because it, it shouldn't be the case that, you know, folks are competing for what is really effectively credit. And then what stops behind them are all the commercial companies and investors and all of them and, and on just the normal individual day to day people who want solutions to solvable problems. But the reason it doesn't get to the starting line is because of patent credit, and having to deal with patent trolls. And I just think that that's a terrible situation for us to be in. especially if it's something that could change the course of humanity it almost feels like uh, an arbitrator has to come in here and force a settlement. What do you think Freeberg is the right thing to do? Obviously, we have a tradition of people getting to you know, monetize, uh, dare I say, their innovations for some period of time with a patent. I have multiple businesses I'm involved in where we uh, leverage CRISPR. And uh, I, I will tell you that the, um, you know, the, the group at Harvard, so, so the history is the group at Harvard and the group at Berkeley argue, each argue that they discovered CRISPR-Cas9 around the same time, each, or each argue that they, that they have a right to CRISPR technology uh, based on their discoveries that were made around the same time. And so for years, each of them have been starting companies and licensing CRISPR technologies to different companies. And all of those companies now, including several that are public, uh, it turns out that if this, uh, this ruling, you know, is to be believed, they actually have a license to a technology that they may not actually have a license to. So um, there is a company that emerged a few years ago and actually made an open sourced version of this, uh, this system. And so I have uh, at least one company in gene editing, in plant, e plant gene editing, where we leverage this open sourced version of this system. 
And uh, many more companies, many more businesses are embracing that open source alternative. I don't think that we see this turning out to be any different than what we saw with the proliferation of Linux in computer software, where, uh, you know, Microsoft or whomever was trying to, you know, make everyone pay a licensing fee to use their operating system. And guess what markets discovered? They discovered that, hey, if someone is able to make something free and open source it, everyone will embrace it. And here we are, uh, where most of the internet is run on open source software. So, you know, I, I, I don't know what the right thing to do with respect to patents are, because, it, you know, the, the truth is, a lot of very difficult, very expensive technology R&D dollars go into developing a technology that is theoretically, someone could look at it and make a copy of it. And so I do think that there are rights to defend with respect to patents. I think that there is if there is something that is a critical resource that an entire industry really needs to access, an open source solution will emerge, you know, the markets take care of it. And I think we've already seen that with CRISPR. So, um, you know, it's hard to say at the end of the day, you want to license a mo you know, a patent a molecule and be the only person that can make that molecule and make money from it, go ahead. But if everyone's going to need that molecule to run their business and to change the world, someone's going to make a cheaper alternative or a free alternative. That's just the way markets work. So Sachs would like to recite a poem for peace <laughs> at the end of the podcast. He's gone totally soft. The pacifist, <laughs> David Sachs. No, I'd like to I'd like to address what, what you said when you called me a pacifist. Because um, I think, oh, actually, my God, here we no, go. I After think, hours. No, I this is all in after dark. Here we go. He's an existential pacifist. Go ahead, Sachs. Read your poem. When did I become a pacifist? Well, I'm not, I'm not really a pacifist. Look, I still believe in the idea of peace through strength, like Reagan said. Okay. But I remember mm. when we, what is the only clean win that we've had in a war since World War II? America has. Clean it was the win. Straight shot. Clean the win. first Iraq war when we drove Saddam out, out of, of Kuwait. Out of Kuwait. That was yeah. George Herbert Walker Bush. Our last and, conventional war. Well, it was also the last war that we actually won. Every other war that we've done has been turned into a fiasco. Well, winning a was pretty easy to define. Get out of Kuwait. The other right. ones we were well, trying to do but revolutions. Remember, but remember, everybody wanted him to go all the way and march into Baghdad and change the regime, replace Saddam. And he said no. And he had the wisdom to stop. And everybody called him a wimp. But he still had the determination and the, and the, the wisdom to stop. And then what happened? His son comes in. 10 years later, and they Watch finish revenge. the job, yeah. they get they take out Saddam, and they destabilize the entire Middle East. That's what the iron ass has got us. So what has turned me against these regime change wars? It's look, when I was in college, I thought Herbert Walker Bush was a wimp, you know, and, and George W. Bush was doing the right thing going into Iraq 20 years ago. But we've seen the results. And anybody today who doesn't modify their point of view on these regime change wars is a fool. I mean, they're not paying attention. And so for Lindsey Graham and, you know, these other guys out there to be a lot of Republicans to be talking about regime change as something we should be seriously promoting, they've totally lost the script and they should be denounced as reckless, dangerous fools. And look, I'm seeing it on both sides of the aisle, but what we need to do now, listen, if it ends up being the case that the Russian people want to make a change, that's, that's up to their them. call. That's, that's their, their call. call. Yes. Obviously, I'm not opposing something that they might want to do. But for the idea that that should be our goal, that's our end game, that's our objective, that is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, we'll just wind up getting in a perpetual war, then when we leave, it will revert. And that's what we saw. It reverts back to communist or authoritarianism, the people have to really want it. Revolutions are hard fought and bloody. And if you think you can just go in there with a couple of drones and get everybody to decide, oh, we embrace democracy from this point forward because you drone the hell out of the country is farcical and it's proven to be wrong. 100% no agreement gonna, with you. No, no ceasefire is going to be possible. I mean, it's going to be hard enough as it is to get anything remotely like a deal, but it's not going to be possible if you're, you've defined regime change yeah, as no. your objective. It's way to dig Putin in. Like that's literally what he wants to, you know, that, that, that you're giving him all the pretext he needs to keep this thing going if it's self-preservation right. all right everybody there's your overtime Sachs's uh <laughs> Sachs's writers were freaking out in the writer's room that he had to get his last point in before i pinned him as a pacifist there are no writers for this stuff j cal because look no. everybody on cable news is singing from the same hymnal and following the same script they're all being the drums of war there's gross. only it's one gross to watch. critique right now which is we're not doing enough and we're being weak and biden needs to do more we're not being weak I agree. Having We're patience not is nothing. not being We weak. are doing a lot. We're doing a lot. And we should be careful. D 
de-escalation oh, yeah. is the opposite of weak. These economic sanctions are real. We have to They're follow work. through. And I think we have to make sure that the economy is supported while we do it. On that note, uh, let's pray for peace. And we'll see you all uh, next week on the podcast. The All-In Summit is May 15th to the 17th, 16th and 17th are the two days of the conference. Poker on the 15th, uh, Tournament for Charity events every night of the week. Uh, and uh, you can apply for our scholarship at the website summit.allinpodcast.co or just type in the All In Summit into Google will be the first link. Uh, and uh, 400 of 600 tickets have been allocated, uh, either sold or for scholarships. We're gonna do the best we can to have as great of an audience there as possible. And for the dictator, Chamath Palihapitiya, the Rain Man, David Sachs, and the Sultan, Sultan of Science, hot off the launch of Canna. Congratulations, turning literally water into wine. Uh, David Friedberg, I'm Jake Cal, and we'll see you next love time. Love you, boys. And love you, besties. Bye. -bye. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man, David Sachs. And it said we open source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, besties. Ice Queen of Kinwa. Feet. Feet. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. Besties are I'm back. I'm doing all in.